<laughs> well, good morning. Wow, what a weekend. It's been kind of interesting. It's Memorial Day or whatever day it was. Weekend, three days. The opportunity to take time, I guess, to set aside for those that have died in service to their country or at least in some way put into your mind the remembrance of people who may or may not be in heaven and some that may be in hell but in some way have made a choice to use their life in service to or in wasting that with which God holds precious which is the living soul because no matter how you live, when you die, your soul will go to stand before the living God. And then, according to what you've done in this life, well, you know, God's going to hold you accountable. And if you've already figured it out, if you cry out for grace and mercy, knowing full well that there's no way, no way on earth that you could possibly live a perfect life, then you know, you pretty much get to the example of what Jesus said to do. Call upon the name of the Lord so that you can be saved. Because when you stand before God, you're standing before the Father in heaven. And there's no messing around here. You could offer up every excuse you want to in this life and lay down your life for your country or lay down your life for your friends or do some silly thing with what your life, the fact that you're breathing and have an existence now, you think you understand. Jesus said, you know, this is eternal life, that they should know me and know him who sent me. And I kind of would think that maybe along the way you kind of learned not to waste your life. But if you did, well, if you're sitting in hell, there's no business me talking to you. If you're sitting in heaven, there's no business me talking to you either. Because it's already open. You've made your choice. But for the rest of us, we kind of ought to look at these days as every day the Lord has made. Because we have the opportunity to rejoice in it, to give voice for it, to be a witness, to be a testimony, to give an example of the life of a believer, to promote the gospel, to share those things that might help someone to not go there, meaning to put themselves in jeopardy, that Jesus said, sufficient is the day and the evil thereof. He said, you don't know the day or the hour of your death, much less your life. He said, you can't add one hair to your head, so, you know, why should you worry about tomorrow? So, a lot of these things that Jesus said had to do with a long-term view of life, not a short-term, give it to me now, let me get it while I can, get it while it's good kind of mentality. A lot of people live their lives, get it while it's good, they want to have it now and pay for it later. And sadly, the thing about the holiday that just passed, somehow paid for it. The fact that they no longer have the chance to find Jesus. What can I say? I don't look at the holiday as being so wonderful, but a time of solemn reflection. That's what death should be. To remind us that we all will God. For the soul that sinned it shall surely die. But the good news is that Jesus has the keys to death and hell. He literally can give you eternal life. So I'm thrilled with the idea that, hey, man, I'm saved. God's got me. He's taking care of me. He's going to provide for me because he's given me a way of salvation. He's given me a way of escape that I'll be able to bear this life because there's no temptation taking me but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer me to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that I'd be able to bear it. So the fact that I can't live a perfect life is perfect example of what he's provided for me, why I don't go by works of righteousness that I've done or am doing, but rather by his mercy he's saving me because of his grace that he's extended to me because of what his son has done. And I'm thrilled about that part, because that's what I want to share with everyone that would dare to listen and care enough about each other to proffer salvation through the gospel that Jesus has proclaimed, to speak liberty to those that are held captive by the sins that they find themselves in that they can't get out of, that they have no other hope except through Jesus to come unto the Father. 
that they would be saved. So it was an interesting day, and quite frankly, it brought me to what I'm thinking of today as the sun hasn't quite risen over the Wasatch Mountains and we're supposed to have a really hot day. I even got a little sunburn yesterday, but I got singed in such a way that it made me think of something today. Have you ever had anybody rattle your cage? <laughs> you ever have anybody like push your buttons? You ever had someone poke the bear? <laughs> You know, throw rocks at the cars, you know what I mean? <laughs> Ew, don't do that. Or, you know, stick a finger in a hornet's nest. I don't think anyone's really stuck a finger in a hornet's nest, but you get the picture, right? Kind of provoke, or invoke, or stoke, or somehow cause an irritation or an aggravation. Have you ever been walking along and you get a rock in your shoe? You know, it's kind of like, you know, you're just walking along and then you get this little tiny rock. Or even worse, you know, like I have, I do a lot of gardening, so I get this kind of like potting soil. And the potting soil is kind of like chewed up wood. I mean, most potting soils have a lot of wood chewed up in it, you know, like just really tiny, smashed up or whatever. Well, every now and then you get these little tiny slivers that you can't see. And those little tiny slivers go into your skin and you really need a needle and a haystack. Well, no, you need a needle and a magnifying glass, you know, to find that little sucker and get it out because every time something touches it, ooh, ouch, it provokes. It provokes a response. You go, ow, <laughs> and you want that sucker out. Well, sometimes people do that to you. Sometimes, whatever reasoning behind it, God allows it for you to learn from it. It's what we like to say, poking the bear. You know, don't poke the bear, it'll wake up, you know, then or don't, you know, like uh, cause someone to stumble is what a lot of people like to say when they're trying to say, oh, well, you know, don't, don't stumble someone, you know, and they're trying to make you do what they want you to do. But really, the bottom line is what do we do who have been poked? What do we do who has been provoked? What do you do if you're the one that someone is sticking their thumb in your eye? I mean... Do you offer them your other eye? <laughs> of course not. You pop them one, right? I mean, that's the American way. Or better yet, nowadays, it's you pull out your gun and shoot them. I mean, that's the common theme in the news. It's always interesting to say in the news because you're never going to hear good news, so why do you watch the news? Because it's always going to exaggerate whatever news you got. Everything on a news story is exaggerated for effect in order to cause you to watch it longer and more and then to exaggerate it to a point of let's let's discuss that part that doesn't apply and that part that doesn't apply and this and just in case you know we'll cover that too you know because we got to keep you on the air I mean after all we're paid for by advertising that's the news <laughs> so I'm always laughing when I say in the news but you know when someone you know is reporting the stories you know you hear about all these you know, killings by guns and you know it's quite frankly serious topic but also it's overblown in a lot of ways I personally don't think anyone should carry guns I don't think that you should need them I think God can provide for you better than you can provide for yourself it's also why I don't say you know like the current fun topic of fallacy in other words propaganda that's false that people are saying it's like well Freedom isn't free, it's done by soldiers, you know. They died so that you could be free. No, they didn't. They died because they got sent to an army in a terminal situation of a bad location that they shouldn't have been there or might not have been there on purpose, but somebody sent them there. And then afterwards, of course, to the victor belong the spoils, and history is written by those that won. Quite frankly, the people in the country didn't say the same thing that the people that are uh, <clears throat> went there in war are saying. The people in the country probably said, those invaders. <laughs> so they're not really saying the same thing Americans are saying about why they invaded the country. They might be saying, we got invaded. And we might be saying, well, we had to protect ourselves. Yeah, okay, if you say so. Now, Israel, when it was like surrounded by enemies, God said, don't turn to Egypt. Don't turn to, you know, these other countries, but turn to me. Call upon me and I'll save you. And he even demonstrated it with the Syrians one time where he said, he, I'll even use a bee. I'll put a hornet in their bonnet, you know, so to speak, and I'll drive them out. 
Remember what we said about provoke the bear? Provoke the bear? Well, God turned the tables on that one. It's kind of like when you provoke the living God, he could use even just one bee or maybe one hornet's nest to drive out an army. And he did. It was really weird, but you know, God said, hey, I've, I've used a bee. I've called them forth. And he even used rumors one time to drive out an army. Oh, sure, people say, but in the Old Testament, God used this and that and the other thing. But what about what he also used? There are examples of him using no forcible means at all. That's kind of interesting. There are examples of God using angels to destroy an entire army in one night. Interesting. But we don't talk about those. We talk about when he sent in Joshua to destroy the land. Well, I think the first time he went into the land, God sent Joshua to march around it, not go through it. So, you know, a certain amount of teaching, you know, you may want to re-examine why you think violence is an answer when God says turn to him. But what I learned this last weekend, as the sun's getting closer to rise, was that people will provoke you. People will invoke certain responses from you that you have control of how you react to those opportunities to present yourself in a certain way or react or act accordingly as God has said to present yourself in a certain way. Now, Paul said to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. So my reasonable service every day is to present my body as a living sacrifice. Now, I don't know about you, but a lot of people get this idea of sacrifices though, well, you know, I get to still go do what I want to do. Uh, when you're a sacrifice, you're bound up. You're tied down. You don't get to open your mouth. You don't get to do anything except be slaughtered. When Jesus was presented before that sly fox, <laughs> Herod, who was at the time the king of Israel, he spoke not a word because, quite frankly, God didn't want him to. There was no way of opportunity for Herod to turn the tables or to argue or to debate. He wanted him to speak and finally just drew him out of his court by giving him a robe and, you know, sending him back to... <laughs> sending him back to uh, the Roman procurator. Um, can't think of him at this moment, but by sending him back, he said, look, I'm done with him. You know, I've had it. You know, this is all just a manipulation anyway, so I'm not going to deal with it. You deal with it. And the other guy said, you deal with it. And they finally dealt with it, you know, and God had his day in court, so to speak. And each person had an opportunity to act or to react according to what was presented before them. Yesterday I had an opportunity to act or react according to someone, two of them, who provoked me. And they came at me from t two different opposite angles and I was surprised because it was like, you don't really think that you're going to, you know, be provoked when you are going along, you know, and the Lord's just blessing you and ministry's growing or challenges come up. You still just go, well, you know, challenges come up, you know, and you deal with them. And it's like, you know, if you've been a Christian a long time, you're kind of used to it. And it's like, well, all right, you know, blah, blah, blah. But sometimes you don't know that something may be inside or there may be a trial or there may be something going on outside that rattles your cage, that just interrupts your systemic or your theology or your meology in some way that you go, well, what was that all about? And it was kind of interesting was that I had one of those days and it fits with what the Lord's saying today, you know, in his devotional to us as the sun's rising. You know, it says, the Lord is good and a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows them that trust in him. You see, our ministry has always been about trusting in the Lord with all our heart, meaning not in our own understanding, but in all our ways, acknowledging him and letting him direct our path. So we always tell people, look, you know, you, you got a problem with me, go tell Jesus. You got a problem with this ministry, go tell Jesus. You got a problem with the church, go tell Jesus. Because those three things, you know, technically, I mean, for me, if you're talking about me, hey, I, I'm all open to what Jesus has to say to me. If God tells me whatever, I'll do it. That's pretty clear. And if I don't do it, I suffer the consequences, and I pretty much admit I didn't do it. God told me, and I didn't do it. And I'll even share with you, there are times God's told me things to do I don't do. I'm rebellious, just like you. 
But when I do them, I'm blessed. So then I enter into his rest. So it's kind of fun that way. And I've entered into that same place by not being provoked beyond measure that with which someone tried to invoke a response from me. One person tried to rattle the cage by a, calling me a liar about my military you know, record because he was all into his fathers, 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 serving in, you know, some foreign land or, you know, killing people in the name of God and country, you know, and apparently he loved that response, and I just simply said something about, well, you know, the majority of people that go to war aren't Christians, and we should do a better job of sharing the gospel and preparing those soldiers who are getting ready to go to war by witnessing to them, because if they die and go to hell, they've wasted their life doesn't matter what they did with their life. A soldier in hell is no hero. That's just the bottom line. Anyone in hell is no hero. As a matter of fact, a person in hell is a fool. And the Bible says so. Jesus said, you know, only the foolish go to hell. And yet so many there are that go thereof. Because Jesus said, wide is the way and broad is the gate that leads to destruction. And many there be that go thereof. Well, as many as many, I figure that's more than a few, and the few are what God said are chosen. So, hey, it's not a genius to figure out that the majority of people that go to war probably aren't thinking through what they do. And judging by the response of their families or what the statistics say or what, you know, has out there for us to look up on Google, because the person was challenging me on every single detail that I mentioned. I said something about the majority of people, you know, blah, blah, blah. he says, well, it can't be majority. So, Ask the VA, you know, because I was in the VA at the time. I remember during the the Nam War about, you know, the majority of people not being Christian that went to Nam, you know, maybe they were in secret. <laughs> and the person kept saying, well, you can't know who goes, who gets saved. And I said, I don't know who gets saved. I'm saying we ought to present the gospel to everyone we can, because that's the majority of what Jesus said to do. He didn't say, you know, occupy this land and enjoy a wonderful life and have children and 2.6 kids, you know, and do this, that, and the other thing. He said, hate the world. Set aside your priorities. Do what I'm telling you to do. Follow me. I'm like, that's what made a Jesus read. But this person took exception, and I was surprised by it. And I said, okay, then don't do it. You know, I mean, that's pretty much. You do what God tells you to do. And then the person called me a liar. That rattled my cage. I thought, okay, I don't mind if I've made a mistake, you know, and I don't mind if someone calls me a liar if I'm lying, because, you know, all men are liars and the truth is not in them, or at least David said, in my haste I have said all men are liars, and I, I pretty much can catch everyone, every human being in a lie at some point in time, because people say white lies, little lies, political lies, lies of necessity, lies of convenience, lies of this, that, and the other thing. And, I pretty much go with the Romani, Romaine kind of idea that all men are liars and the truth is not in them. Because the heart is deceitful and perverse and wicked and, you know, just evil inside. And, you know, God changes us, but, you know, till we finally arrive in heaven, you know, I figure everybody's going to lie at some point in time, you know. So this guy decided to attack on the internet where things are posted for a long time, the ministry. And I went, whoa. No, you can attack me. You can crucify me, you know, and I'll, I'll probably agree with you. You know, you say, hey, you know what, Michael, you're a sinner. I'll go, yeah, yeah. five minutes alone, I'll sin. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a sinner, saved by grace. But I am a sinner. I have no problem with that. I know that I am, so I cling to the grace I've been given. I ask for the forgiveness of God to cling to my personal relationship with Jesus, that he would continue to work in me and on me and through me to the accomplishment of his will by the Spirit of God to present me faultless before the Father with exceeding joy. So I'm thrilled about that. Everybody should cling to that same perspective. But the interesting thing is the person wasn't offering hope. They were offering condemnation. And that's when I take an exception to what they're doing. When you're trying to present what God wants to do for others that they can't do for themselves. When you're giving someone like a life raft or you say, I'm giving you, you know, a, a opportunity to do something or you're sharing with them something that will help them, you really don't need someone coming along and telling you, you know, well, you're wrong in helping that person. You know, you shouldn't help that person. You shouldn't be saying those kind of things. You, know, you, should, you should do it a different way. That's not good. You're wrong. That's false. Well, you know, I say false a lot. 
But I always back it up with whatever God says at the time, because if it's false, you know, it's pretty easy to prove. So the person came at me, you know, and I, I was like, but Lord, why is this person doing it? Because this was someone that I knew before I got saved. And this person got saved either after I did or sometime along the way. And over the years, once in a blue moon, you know, I've gone to like a class reunion and seen how he's been, you know, and what he's done, and I thought, well, I hope he's okay. You know, I've said, you know, casual prayers for him, you know, kind of like over the years, and, you know, kind of, well, you know, I mean, he's in a very interesting area where, you know, you, you got all of the gospel that's being presented. I mean, it's like the center of Christianity, so to speak, in some ways. So it's kind of amazed that, you know, it's kind of like the things that I've heard and read and said, you know, and that's like, well, you know, okay, well, people, each one has their own, you know, venue, they have their own ministry, their own little part or big part or whatever part. It may be only one thing that God ever uses you for in this life, but when you do it, you've run the race, you've accomplished the purpose. You may be a little teacup, as we used to say, you know, in God's kingdom, and you may be a teacup, but guess what? You're overflowing with whatever little amount of space you have inside for God. The fact of overflowing doesn't change. Whether you're a giant vessel or a little tiny vessel, God wants you to overflow with his love, with his mercy, with his grace. So in that respect, I'm thrilled even as this hummingbird came over, you know, blessed me by going back up there and checking me out. I'm thrilled to preach and to teach and to relate the gospel of grace because I know that no one can present themselves faultless before the Father, but Jesus can present us faultless before the Father. The Spirit of God can do that in us because it's the same Spirit with which Jesus was risen from the dead. So I know that it's not of ourselves, but it's of God's gift to us by what Jesus has done. So. When I got rattled, I was a little frustrated and I kept going, but Lord, what is going on? And I just couldn't understand it because the person kept coming back vicious. Very, you know, notice that? Whenever, you know, I mean, I wasn't trying to defend it because that's one thing I know better. You know, you don't defend yourself. You just offer things to try to get them to a conclusion. I always try to point them in a direction that eventually leads them back to Jesus. And so I finally said, look, have you asked Jesus about this? You know, I was have you talked to Jesus? So the person made a direct, direct confrontation and a direct accusation. And I went, whoa, a direct accusation. I thought, Lord, now I feel sorry for the person. And I did. I felt sorry for them. I just kind of you know, closed the conversation, felt sorry for them, and walked away. Because, you see, when you make an accusation, if you're accurate, then you've got the facts and the details. But if you haven't researched it and you have the person and you're the person being accused and it's totally inaccurate because you lived it you go uh, I could be accused of a lot of things that I don't know about and I could be accused of never having a baby you know if I had said I you know gave birth I'd be a liar I've never given birth you know metaphorically or spiritually but anyways my point is no I've never given birth I've never had my womb give birth to a baby so if I said that I gave birth to a baby, I'd be a liar. The truth would not be in me. But if I said that I have been a father, and I had been a father, which I haven't, but if I had been a father and I had given birth to a child by participating in that donation of part of my seed, and my seed and a woman's seed and God's spirit came together to form a living soul, then if I said that I have been a father and the person said, well, you've never been, you know, you've never given, you've never had a family, and I had, then I would be saying, well, you know, obviously you're foolish, you know, because you don't know the facts. But the person could say, well, you never gave birth. And I'd say, well, you're right, I never gave birth, but I've been a father, if I had been a father. So this person came and accused me, and I was amazed because I thought about it as I answered them, you know, and I left it go, you know, but then I kind of wept a little bit inside because it was like, why would a person go to that extreme and then make themselves out to be foolish? And then the Lord spoke to me, and it was like, I kind of got all mushy inside and gushy inside. Because whenever Jesus defends you, whenever the Spirit of God apprehends you in a situation after you've gone through the trial, 
you just go, oh, Lord, no. You know, and so the Lord showed me the answer to the question. You know I mean? The person was accusing me, and I was like, what? Am I wrong, Lord? And that's what I said. I said, Lord, am I wrong? Because it was something about, you know, details, you know. And God showed me exactly the answer, and I went, wow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the answer. So I gave it to them, and boy, People don't want truth when they're already accusing you. So I gave them the truth and then let it go and then that was done. You know, it's like I was over with. I didn't give them the truth in public. I gave it to them in private. And then they came back with all kinds of vitriol. And I was like, whoa, this feels like Peter, you know, Peter syndrome. You know, when Peter was telling Jesus, don't go to Jerusalem. And Jesus was saying, Peter, you don't know the big picture. You have no idea what spirit you speak of. I'm going to die on purpose. No one takes my life, but I give it up willingly. So, you know, Peter was like not knowing the rest of the story or the full picture. And quite frankly, you know, I had to let this go because the person doesn't know the full picture or the rest of the story. And I gave them the facts. They can look it up, you know, and find it. But, you know, that's what God will do for you. If you have your cage rattled at some point in time, you know, like you're trusting in the Lord. If you're in ministry and you have your, you know, you're, you're a bear of a person and you get poked, God will protect you. If you're some kind of you know, situation or circumstance that you're innocent, give it over to God and let go. Let Him be your strength. Let Him be your strong tower. Let Him be your defense. You don't have to go on the offensive. You don't have to defend your position. You speak the truth in love and then stop when God says stop. You trust in the Lord with all your heart. You lean not in your own understanding, but in all your ways, of course you acknowledge Him, because if you are doing the Lord's will, if, and that's a big if, sometimes people go out there and they stick their neck out, you know, and they get it chopped off, you know, and I know better. You know, I don't open my mouth unless I know the facts, and I don't tell someone something's false unless I have all the facts. And I make sure that I've researched it all. And then if I'm wrong, I'll say, sorry, <laughs> I am wrong. And I'll admit it, I am wrong, I have made a mistake, I researched it, I was wrong. There is no, you know, excuse, there is no anything except an apology, and this is my retraction, and this is my reasoning, and this is why I know that I'm wrong, and I admit that I'm wrong, and I'm fully wrong. But after having done that a long time ago, it's like, I'm very careful about what I put on the internet. <laughs> because back, way back when, over 20 years ago, Back in the Usenet days, you know, it's like, yeah, I got confronted one time about something that was wrong, and I went, and I hated it, because I learned that at Calvary, Chapel Costa Mesa. Some Christian, or some, yeah, some Christian actually confronted me and said, I couldn't use, behold, I stand at the door and knock, because it was written to Christians to witness to non-Christians. I went, now, obviously, somebody's going to argue about that and say, well, you know, you could. I went, no, I can't, because I was dealing with Jews at the time, you know, I was witnessing to non to uh, Jews that didn't know Jesus and believe me if you get into Jewish culture you're gonna find out that Jews know the Bible <laughs> not as believing it but they know the Bible <laughs> for whatever reason <laughs> but you know it was one of those things that you better be accurate about what you're saying the Bible says or the scripture says or what it means in the intention because someone else that's at contention with you will have a whole different you know uh, Jewish history of being able to dump on you, you know, and to kind of perform a slam dunk on you. Ouch! And they did. They they did a slam dunk on me that was like, wow, that was powerful. And I went mad at God for about a year <laughs> until I, you know, because I kept saying, Lord, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to preserve you. I don't want to do that. If that's the way you treat me, blah, 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 you know. And so I got over it, you know, because God showed me that it wasn't my fault. It was just my lack of experience in learning before speaking and investigating before instigating any kind of response in a person. Because I do instigate responses. I want to provoke you in some way. I want to rattle your cage. I want to upset your apple cart. But I want you to see what it is you have in your cart. Wormy apples. Or, you know, you're provoked because you're talking about other things, not Jesus. Or you're saying things that are false, that aren't true because I want to provoke you into seeking that truth that we all can invoke a response in, asking God to direct us. And that's what we do today in the Word for Words Cross. You want to 
be provoked by anyone and everything to invoke the Spirit of God to direct you in the way that you should go today. And so in the Word we have that. We have, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows them that trust in Him. Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for His mercy endures forever. God is our refuge, God is our strength, a very present help in trouble. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, and He is my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Who is like unto thee? O, oh, who is like unto thee, O oh, sword of... Well, actually, that's not what it says. Who is like unto thee, O oh, people saved by the Lord? The shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thy excellency? As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried, and he is a buckler to all them that trust in him. For he is God, for who is God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? If any man love God, the same is known of him. The foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his. And that everyone that nameth the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. The Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, and the way of the ungodly shall perish. Though thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. You know, when Jesus spoke that to me yesterday in his own personal way, and then affirmed it today, I knew because it carried through the night that my sorrow had endured for but an evening, but joy has come in the morning that God has affirmed himself to me. God has confirmed to me that, hey, you know, I'm not weird, you know, because the second person that attacked me and provoked was saying, you know, you're taking all these scriptures out of context. Jesus didn't say, my sheep hear my voice. Jesus wasn't talking about knowing people personally. Jesus wasn't like, you know, saying you should know God personally. That's like wrong. You should have an exegesis that directs you back to the Word of God, and you should always have yourself found surely in the Word without ever there being this personal application, interpretation, or point of reference that God supposedly speaks to people. He doesn't do that. I was like, well... You could argue that, I guess, but me personally, yeah, he did, and I do, and I am, and so guess what? I can't argue that point with you, because he already has. God spoke to me directly, and I'm going to have a problem with that for the rest of my life, for eternity. I would say Jesus, to anyone, does speak directly, will speak indirectly, and will speak directly. He can choose circumstance, he can choose and use his word, he can use a donkey, he can use any way means possible that he wants to. Because it's the Word of God by the Spirit of God to the people of God and the Son of God revealing Jesus. And whatever He chooses, He could take you into heaven and reveal Himself. He could take you into, well, He won't take you into hell, but He could do a lot of things that He'll probably choose to use certain other ways and means, but as far as what He said, and I posted it. And the person didn't want to, you know, listen and said, Oh, you know, well, so-and-so wouldn't do that, and so-and-so doesn't believe that, and so-and-so. I said, well, I'm glad you're talking for them. I only know this, Jesus I talk to. Jesus can talk to you. The scripture says he can. The word of God says he will. Bible says that it's a promise. You can use that by way of means of investigation. And he said, you know, you're wrong. The exegesis is wrong, it's, it's not true. I was like, well, fine, you know. If the Bible doesn't mean what it says, you're you're probably gonna go off on some personal interpretation of it. So fine, I don't mind, you know, so go ahead. If it works for you, praise the Lord. Just like, and I told him, just like Chuck Smith said, Chuck Smith said, you know, if you think that the Spirit of God is taking you someplace else, then go. You know, he said, you know, we're not stopping you from leaving, you know. If you if you and the Spirit of God, you know, are going somewhere, then, you know, the Holy Spirit, you know, and you go, and then we'll watch and see, and if it's good, we'll, you know, ask you back, or ask you to, you know, teach us of whatever it is that you learn. But we have to do what the Holy Spirit is teaching us, or directing us. You go do whatever God tells you to. If he sends you some other church, go. And you know, it's always been a Calvary principle. And this guy came back at me and said, that's not what Chuck Smith said. And if I could talk to Chuck, I knew Chuck back in the 60s. And I knew Chuck just a couple years ago. And you know, it would be interesting if he was alive because he wouldn't even bother, you know, talking to you because he'd be so disappointed in how bad you were relating. And I went, really? I said, that's kind of interesting. You know, I mean, I was thinking this because I was laughing by that time because I've already been through the whole day. You know, and I kind of went, well, this is interesting because I've already been set up by one person. Now this person thinks that he's going to make me feel guilt or some response. First of all, 
nobody's ever been a Chuckite unless they're Chuckites. You know, you don't follow a man, you follow the Lord. So you're not following somebody's teaching. I mean, if you want to, you can, I guess. You could be a Spurgeonite, you could be a Tozerite, you could be a Chuckite, you could be a MacArthurite, you know, I mean, I mean, you could be a religious, you could be a Baptist, you could be a Protestant, you could be a Catholic, you, you know, you could be all these things that you, you use those words because you're following that systemic or that system of beliefs and you want to identify and separate yourself from others by making it obvious that you're one of those kinds of people because you've got it written on your forehead and on your t-shirt and you know you're running around saying hey but i'm a southern baptist so i believe this or hey i'm a lutheran so i believe this and you know don't bother me because i'm a lutheran don't don't cross over that line or i'm whatever it may be you know like well all right you know if you really think so but do you think you're really going to cause me to worry about something that you're saying to follow a man Man, if anything, Chuck would have told me, hey, go follow Jesus. You know, if Jesus is telling you to do, go do. We're not going to go with you, but, you know, you go do. You know, we'll watch. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, if he didn't get that, okay, you know. I said, I could tell him what tape, but okay, cassette tape. <laughs> it's all right. I don't mind, you know. Like, he wanted to go his own way. But the point of it is this. Even as we read, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. The day of trouble will come upon you. There's going to be times where people will rattle your cage, poke you as a bear, you know, invoking you some response, try to cause you to doubt. And it's okay to have kind of like maybe sometimes a quasi ushy feeling inside, like you just, you know. But when you do, do like we just read in all of these. And I'll give you all the references just real fast. In Nahum 1.7, in Jeremiah 33.11, in Psalm 48.1, in Psalm 91.2, in Deuteronomy 33.29, in 2 Samuel 22.31 and 32, in 1 Corinthians 8.3, in 2, I believe it's Timothy 2.19, in Psalm 1.6, and in Exodus 33.17. Let the Lord speak to you, because whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, that you should do. So be blessed today. Even if it's a tough day or, you know, a rough day or whatever day it may be. But in the day of trouble, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. Hey, you don't know what's going on. But in all your ways acknowledge Him and let Him direct your path and then rejoice. Because this is the day, Woods Cross. This is the day, Bountiful. This is the day, Utah. This is the day, the rest of the world, that the Lord has made. He causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall, the wicked and the good. So, hey... We're all getting the same sunshine. Be blessed by it. The others may contest and argue about whether it's a good day or not. But for me, I'm blessed by the day the Lord has made.